Good afternoon, Ron Paul. Good afternoon, Ajahn Nesoko. Thank you for taking the time to do another q and I think it's been a while now. So today is Monday, 19th of August. And today I wanted to ask you to speak about that initial period of your monastic life. Would you share the story of your fortuitous meeting with this young Canadian novice in Vientiane that led to your novice year unfolding as it did, as it did? Uh, it was I wanted to ordain. I'd made that decision during the, those six months. I was living in Bangkok and I had been practicing meditation at Wan Mahatat in Bangkok. And I found that uh, I became quite confused because amongst the expatriate Buddhists at the time, there was a lot of opinions and views about who's a good teacher and who isn't. And, and uh, I was completely uh, open to all suggestions. <clears throat> But I became so confused that when I had to leave Thailand in order to renew my visa, you could only stay there for so long, then you had to leave and to another neighboring country and to renew the visa and come back in. So I went up to Laos, to Vieng Chan, and there, at a meditation monastery just on the outskirts of the city, I met a Canadian Samanera. And he seemed, when I first met him, I thought he's a bit uh, strange, but he seemed to have had insight. He had a kind of radiance about him that was quite impressive. But then I was traveling, I wanted to visit Luang Prabang, the royal capital of Laos. So I left uh, Vang Tan and went up to spend about a couple of weeks in Luang Prabang. And when I came back to Vang Tan, I had, uh, I had a lot of time before I had to leave to cross over to Thailand. I got the visa for Thailand and then, uh, so I went back to this Wat Nan Panao, no, Wat So Baloang and and there I renewed my acquaintance with this novice. <clears throat> and he advised me, he was, at this time there is a huge conflict. This was 1966, in between the two sects, Thai sects of Buddhists, the Mahanikai and the Tamayut, and, and um, so I found that very confusing because people had strong views about who was right and who was wrong, and, and I didn't know anything about it, really didn't want to know. So this novice advised me to just cross over to Nong Kai, was the town, northern, north eastern Thai town where you cross, there was no bridge to cross the Mekong River at the time, so you had to cross by boat. So you, you went to Nong Kai and then crossed the river in a boat. And so, before I did that, I paid a visit to this Thai novice, to this Canadian novice, and he uh, he said, just go over to 
the main temple what? Uh, Sisakat, there's a main temple in the middle of the Tower of Nongkai, and uh, ordained there. And just on his advice, and he told me to, to when I do that, to spend a year meditating on the Four Noble Truths. And uh, he recommended the Nyanati Luka book, Word of the Buddha, which was published by the Kandy Publication Society. <clears throat> So just on this impulse, I did exactly what he suggested. And uh, the head monk of the Mahanikai sect in Nongkai at the time was, said he'd ordained me as a Samanera novice monk. <clears throat> and so I took Samanera ordination and what season can in Nongkai and then uh, the, the preceptor sent me off to a branch monastery in Nampana, which is about half a kilometer from the town of Nongkai. It was a forest monastery where you, you do this practice of entering a, you, you're given a residence, a kuti, and then from there on they, bring you the food, you have one meal a day, and uh, you have to do this this method, certain method that they uh, recommended, which I'd learned to do at Wat Mahata. So, fair enough, I, I did exactly that. And I spent the first three days in Nikuti, at one man per hour in a state of utter bliss because uh, at last I was alone, free from all the influences of other people. Uh, I couldn't speak a word of Thai and nobody could speak English. My preceptor came and gave me a brief teaching in the Sata Virya Sati Samadhi Panya. What are those called in? The five faculties. The five, five Indriyas. Five Indriyas. And he made me repeat them forwards and backwards. So that, that was the only instruction I had. And uh, so I was alone and they. They respected that everybody you know, treated me quite well, and so uh, the first three days, as I said before, were very blissful. But then I had to deal with with a continuous kind of loneliness, and uh, I tried to do this method that I learned in Bangkok and uh, and you know but it was so strict a method so extreme a method you just no way you could keep it going for the whole day and I didn't have anybody to talk to about it but just this method and then this this book Word of the Buddha and the Samanera and Vieng Tan had recommended this book highly to meditate on. This was the first sermon that the Buddha gave after his enlightenment. And I had really hadn't much uh, understanding of the Pali Suttas. You know, so I was quite, uh, and this was a condensed version, it was like a kind of version of the basic teachings needed to reflect on these Four Noble Truths, suffering, the causes of suffering, the end of suffering, and the path of non-suffering. So, I was, I took the, I became so 
you know, tired of doing this method. And I was, by nature, a, a kind of obsessive reader of books. And that was my experience of life as a layman was I'd always have a book with me and I was reading books and and so whenever I needed something to do I'd read a book and I'd carry books with me wherever I went. But I had this, only this little pamphlet, Word of the Buddha. I didn't have any coffee. <laughs> And just the boring, tedious routine of a day, waking up and waiting for the meal and, and uh, finishing the meal and trying to do this meditation method. And, uh, and I began to feel incredible resentment and anger over nothing because I was, there was nothing in the monastery itself that created this anger. And so, you know, they were treated with great respect and, and I felt, uh, you know, people really wanted me there. So there was no kind of complaint that I could make against the venue that I was living in, but I realized I was suddenly just feeling angry and resentful about everything, about life itself. And uh, I tried to suppress it with these concentration techniques, watching the breath and kind of controlling the mind and, and um, I didn't want to feel angry or, and because I'd spent 31 years suppressing anger as a layman, and finally I just gave up trying to hold it back and I fortunately was alone and just sat in a corner of this meditation hut and anger just poured out of me. Fortunately, I, you know, I didn't make it verbal, but I, I was very much aware of how much anger and resentment I held in my mind. So I just sat in the corner of this hut and let it out. I didn't do it, try to suppress it. And um, I hated everybody, hated God, hated, uh, you know, I saw all kinds of weird things, like hallucinations. And um, I thought it was never going to end. But somehow I had the intention to stay there. I didn't really want to leave, but I wondered what was happening to me because I came to practice meditation to find peace and tranquility. Instead, I was finding just a, a, a non-stop anger, river of anger and resentment. And uh, finally, after about three months, uh, just being angry and hating everybody, I woke up one morning and I was in a state of luminous bliss. And so I <clears throat> thought, well, this is, you know, I couldn't get angry at all. I'd bring up subjects in my mind, memories of things that made me angry and it didn't, didn't, uh, I couldn't get angry. I just was, everything was beautiful and luminous and wonderful. And I thought this must be enlightenment. I thought I was enlightened. 
And then this last, uh, this state of bliss lasted about a week. And I'd sit on the porch of my hut, watching the sunrise as it came in, and the forest went. It was dark at first, and then I noticed the, the beginning to light coming from the sun, and the, and the green of the trees needed light to appear. And I just noticed all kinds of natural things that I hadn't really noticed before, paid it much attention to. I wrote poetry, wrote a long, long letter to my mother about my enlightenment, which I never posted. And then, and then uh, after about five or six days of this unmitigated bliss, I, I had to go into the town to the immigration office to renew my visa. And so uh, I walked from the monastery, it was only about maybe a kilometer or so from the town, walked into the town. And I was so sensitive, I could see that and the suffering of all the merchants on the main street of Nongkai. I was so aware, so completely with the moment, I could see the, the suffering of life from people who were just like, had shops and lived on, you know, that I'd encounter on the street. When I got to the immigration office, I walked in and I was received with a kind of cold, kind of resenting uh, mood from the clerks in the immigration office. And uh, they didn't want to extend my visa, but I think the, the head monk of the province kind of encouraged them to do so. So they did it, but very resentfully. And that wall of resentment completely lifted this state of bliss. It was like a big iron gate crashing right in front of your face. So I got the visa, but I went back to the monastery and, and uh, then I tried to get it back. I wanted to get the state back of luminous bliss. But it had happened quite spontaneously. I wasn't, I didn't have any memory of having a, a state like that. And so I was operating from desire to get something I remembered. And no matter how disciplined or how hard I tried, I couldn't get it back. So I started investigating the noble truths. Excuse me, may I just uh, ask you something here? This whole process, like from you described the first few days of bliss, arriving at the monastery and then settling into the routine, dealing with three months of resentment and anger, and then this blissful experience, how were you making use of this book the whole time? Were you just going back to it and trying to make sense of your experience in terms of the Buddha's teaching the whole time? Or not, you did that later? Or how did that come in? Well, I'd read it for something to do. <laughs> <laughs> but did it inform, did it help inform your outlook on what you're experiencing? Yeah, because it, it made me question why when the Buddha was enlightened, he taught about suffering rather than about inspiring subjects like love and universal love and, and uh, because that's what religions do. They tend to operate from God is love and, and from very inspiring concepts. Right. And uh, it, but when the Buddha was, gave his first sermon, it was, there is suffering, there is the cause of suffering, there is the end of suffering, and there's the way of non-suffering. So this uh, 
I thought because I had such a confidence in my in Buddha Buddhism, and uh, I thought that's something to to learn from, because the first three days of bliss, and then the next three months were suffering. Really suffering, you know, it's just a terrible kind of hell realm to live in, hating everybody and totally ungrateful for anything and just sitting there oozing out resentment and hatred is, is the ultimate suffering, it's like living hell. But it ended. Mm. And it wasn't through, through suppression. I didn't try to stop it. It just stopped itself. When the, it was like uh, suddenly all 31 years of repressed anger and resentment had kind of left me. It, had, it was like I'd opened the door to the prison and they'd all had a chance to escape. Where before I had this image of these uh, hateful creatures were locked in this dirty cell in my mind. And when they tried to get out, I'd slam the door on them. That's how I repressed it. And every time they made a noise, and then I'd, I'd lock the door, the jail cell door, or slam it in their face. And so they were, by the time 31 years, there was a lot of, of uh, anger trying to get out. And so just by sitting and watching it, watching the anger, not trying to suppress it or get rid of it, it naturally it was like opening the door to the jail cell. And uh, all these miserable prisoners that I kept imprisoning me for 31 years all left. <laughs> and there was nothing left, it was just an empty cell. And was that, was that attitude of, that you developed of not trying to suppress it, not trying to slam the cell door back on them. Was that something that just you did intuitively because it had slamming the door on them didn't work? Or was it also informed by reading and rereading and rereading again the book? Well, I didn't, I, I did this uh, practice of just sitting watching it spontaneously. I didn't, okay. nobody told me to do that, but I couldn't perform this method mm -hmm. that I'd learned anymore. I gave up on that. And uh, there was nothing I could do to but just sit and watch this, the, these prisoners leaving the cell. <laughs> and uh, I didn't know how long it would last. But, Three months is a long time when you're in hell. But uh, it passed and then this, this kind of blissful state was, uh, you know, I call that the pure consciousness, which I had no name for, no kind of scriptural knowledge of. I could only see it in a very personal way that I'm enlightened. But because I've never felt that kind of bliss or joy before in my life. And then uh, suddenly it was there spontaneously. And it lasted five, six days. Which, and I was hoping it would last forever. But then when I received this this cold reception at the immigration office and trying to just get back this state of bliss through the desire to through remembering it. 
you know, I realized it wasn't going, I couldn't do it. And suddenly I turned to the Four Noble Truths, the word of the Buddha. <clears throat> and the first noble truth is there is suffering. It's a statement. It's, it's a kind of factual statement. It's not everything is suffering or it's not a proclamation of misery, but it, there is suffering, which is true. There is suffering. And we all suffer. Every human being suffers. And, it, and then the, the, the advice was to understand it. Well, from my generation of the 1950s, we were into kind of uh, self-help books and and trying to understand why we saw, we feel we have problems, uh, self-doubts, and we trace it back to our mothers. At that time, it was very much mother's fault because mother somehow didn't provide the proper engine, but I didn't really, my mother was quite good actually, so I couldn't really find any real good evidence that she was to blame. But that's the mindset. You know, I've read a lot of these self-help uh, kind of psychotherapy books. And uh, I came from middle class family, which was uh, Christian. And uh, so I, you know, I, I didn't, I wasn't abused in any way by my parents. But I also suffered a lot in childhood and just self-consciousness and worry. We were brought up as a Christian, you have these, you're told you were born in sin. And I was uh, very anxious about that, that I was a sinner and I'd go to hell. That was ingrained in me in my early years. And uh, so my my social conditioning, my cultural conditioning was very black and white. This is right, this is wrong. And you are basically, you've got to kind of please God to get on his good side to be saved. But I no longer believed in that by this time because I discovered Buddhism. But still that affects how you interpret experience because it was acquired from early age of childhood. And uh, then understanding suffering wasn't to, to blame your mother or father or God or Christianity or anything, but, you know, the, is to look inward. To understand something, you have to stand under it. Look at it. Suffering is like this. Well, that had never occurred to me. I thought, you know, suffering was imposed on me by external forces. I know uh, there's something wrong with me, basically, that I'm... some screw is loose or bolt not tightened properly. <laughs> You either blame external causes or you blame yourself as a person. But this advice to understand, I contemplated, to understand suffering, you have to look inward. You kind of, the direction is towards your heart, towards your chest, because that's where you feel life, you know, you feel broken hearted or sweet heart or good heart or no heart. And so I started focusing on my heart, just mentally, not trying to look at it because I can't see it, but just in that area of the body that I assume my heart was pumping away, it was uh, focused. And um, I began to see how emotions and 
you know, you're aware of the, the feeling of anxiety or worry, how you're programmed to, uh, to emotionally feel unsafe, un insecure, anxious, self-conscious, um, that there's something wrong with you, basically, or you're not good enough. <clears throat> and so I began to see these as mental states that I began to understand is in terms of Dhamma, which is they're impermanent. Because none of these, the, these states would last long. You know, you try to sustain them, they don't, they can't do it. They reoccur, but you, they have no span of, in a long time being at all. They come and go. So it was more after the three months of suffering dissipated and you had your blissful experience and then that ended that you started using the word of the Buddha to start investigating that whole experience. Yeah. I see. Okay. It seems like that's listening to your teachings. I mean, I've listened, I've heard your teachings for 40 years now and it does strike me how relentlessly you come back to the Four Noble Truths. Would you say that's in great part because you were confined to a kuti without just one book that really formatted your way of seeing things according to this core teaching of the Buddha? Yes, well, my interest originally in Buddhism came through Zen Buddhism. Mm. So I read, I knew nothing of the Theravada and wasn't really interested in it when I was a layman until I went to live in Malaysia where I became interested in Thailand and Vipassana and that through, through uh, just being in Southeast Asia in a Theravadan area. But um, I never really understood the Four Noble Truths. But to me, that was his, the Buddha's first sermon. So, you know, he, why did he teach suffering to his five colleagues who were very good at all kinds of meditation? You know, they were all his friends and colleagues and in the Samana life, in practicing Samatha meditation techniques and being superior to their teachers and developing the highest forms of jhana and, and, uh, and yet when the Buddha gave his first sermon to these five friends, it was their suffering and there's the end of suffering. <laughs> so, so that was, you know, I had contemplated what, you know, why, why would he teach that to these highly developed uh, monks who'd been trained for six, seven years in the highest forms of jhana? And, <clears throat> And so then, uh, the, uh, you know, this is in the scriptures. So I became, after reading this book, the, the Word of the Buddha, you know, it condenses the, for, the first sermon and in, in, in all references all the uh, scriptural quotations according to the first noble truth and lists all the scriptural quotations that they use but it's in a brief form it's not like the Trapidicas terrified me when i looked at it you know because it's so vast and i'd read majima nikaya before i ordained and you know i could understand the words but i didn't understand understand the meaning really or the point of it 
you know, he could, uh, he, I found it inspiring in places, but most of the time just let me, I don't know what they're talking about, but in this uh, word of the Buddha, you know, it's, it's something you can put in your, your back pocket, you know, it's not, <laughs> And so, uh, and uh, this Samanera in Vieng Chan had told me to not read anything else but that. And so, I took his word for it. So when I got through these three months of hell, I began to to really uh, take it seriously. You know, I'd read it before, but. I, I didn't really have the, you know, just an intellectual understanding of it, not an insightful one. And it, it's, a, it's a way to insight, to, you know, suffering, there is suffering, uh, uh, it should be understood. And then the third aspect is it has been understood. So it, it gives you a sequence. Or, three aspects for each noble truth. So understanding, I began to just look at the feeling of self-consciousness or loneliness, just a, like I'm looking at watching a, a mental state inside my body and mind, just uh, being the observer of it rather than uh, trying to get rid of it. And I, I found that, you know, then I began to understand there is suffering. This suffering is here and now, and it's, you know, and, and then it leads to the causes of suffering, which is the second noble truth. So then the three aspects of all phenomena is that they're impermanent suffering and non-personal, non-self, anatta, anicca, dukkha, anatta. So I could contemplate the impermanence of these mental states and uh, just watching uh, loneliness, boredom, you know, living alone all that time is very boring. And um, you can see why people take to drink and drugs, because so much of life is rather boring. <laughs> and uh, but it's a mental state. You know, when you take it personally, then you've got to just get rid of it. You want to, when you're bored, you seek some something to interesting, something to eat, something to drink, watch the TV, and. On and on Anderson. Now in modern technology and internet and all that, there's some easy distractions from the boringness of, of conscious existence in the form that we identify with. And then uh, the second noble truth is the causes of suffering. So suffering is not ultimate reality. It's not, you know, it's not a doomsday depressing teaching. It's just a statement of facts. Because nobody can deny that there is suffering. And then to understand it, you know, you can blame, you know, like we do, we can blame the politicians, the, the, your wife or her husband, we can blame the children, we can blame the neighbors. Blame God, you know. I even got into blaming God for my suffering, and and uh, so the blame is is how we handle suffering, or blame yourself. I'm, you know, I'm not good enough. Something wrong with me. So then, turning inward, you know, and you begin with a concept of anicca, impermanence, you know, so you're watching and these mental states arise and cease, 
and you know, so you're, you're watching, you're observer of it. And they all cease, you know, even the ones you think will never go away, eventually do if you're patient. And so then the cause of suffering is attachment to desire. So this is very important, like desire. What, what is desire, the second noble truth? And they list three categories of desire, which I found very helpful, incredibly helpful to me, because in my American conditioning, desire usually meant sexual desire or greed for food or power. So the desire always had a kind of pejorative connotation to it, but then in the Second Noble Truth, there's sensual desire, which is quite obvious. You know, when you look at something, you look at the flowers and they're pretty, you want to look at them. That's desire. Your, your eye is seeing something beautiful and you, you want it. I mean, you, that's just the way that this realm is. It's a desire realm. When those flowers fade and those roses start turning brown, then you don't desire them anymore. You want to get rid of them, which is another kind of desire. So, so I never thought of that. You know, I just thought of wanting to get rid of what I don't like, you know, is, is virtue. Like wanting to get rid of anger is, is a noble desire. You know, I want, I, Tomato. I want to get rid of my anger. It, that seems like a good desire. And the desire to become something. And that, I could see, was very much my nature wanting to become something that I don't feel I am, trying to get something I don't have. And that's what I, I had done most of my life up to then, was, was trying to get something I didn't have and trying to get rid of my faults, my the control of my sexual drive and, and uh, not be angry anymore, feel the, you know, the nobility of loving kindness and and unconditioned acceptance and love and contentment were very noble ideals that I wanted to fulfill. But then this wanting to become this kind of saint-like person, I began to see it was a form of desire. Because I saw myself as not that good and I had to do something to get rid of the sins and the flaws in order to become this, this uh, saintly ideal. And suddenly I began to realize uh, that, that uh, wanting to get enlightened, wanting to get concentrated, wanting to uh, attain jhanas it was all based on bhava dana or desire for, to get something you don't have. And then vipava dana is the third kind of desire, desire to get rid of what you don't like, what you don't want. So this, was, this helped me to investigate desire. And so I started contemplating the senses, the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, the body itself, the mind itself, the, the, you know, the, the uh, thoughts and emotions, the feelings. They're all impermanent. So everything that makes me a separate person my body, my eyes, my ears, my tongue, my brain, 
everything is is what I, I see as myself is impermanent and unsatisfactory and not self. And I can see, I can understand the first two very well into Anicca and Dukkha, which is impermanence and suffering. But I'd always stuck with this sense of being somebody, meditating, or being a monk, being whatever, being a man, being uh, an American, and on and on like that, with the sense of being a person was so strongly ingrained. I couldn't see how that disappeared with this kind of meditation. But I also <clears throat> had a lot of insight into those first two noble truths before I encountered Ajahn Chah. And uh, so I spent a year at Wat Nan Pranav in Nong Kai just, just contemplating uh, the impermanence and the, the advice is to let go of desire. So I had this insight into letting go of desire, which I, to let go of desire, you have to accept it, understand it. And these three categories gave you the way to investigate and understand desire. And then you realize the bodies of desire form. It's natural in it for survival and desires to procreate the species or to survive. This is natural to to all creatures, you know, whether they're human or animals or whatever. You know, this this is part of the the nature of phenomena. It's it's uh, it's a desire form, and if you are attached to the desires, then you're always, there's always something to fear, something to do, something to control, something to get, something to, you've got to become. Just as a human being in society, you've got to protect yourself. You know, it's a necessity, is self-preservation. So this is, is seen in a very personal way, such as what they call atta, tuton. This is my ego. This is what I am. I'm these, these desires. So when I I had an insight during this year that I needed to ordain as a bhikkhu. I needed a teacher and uh, a way of living that I didn't manipulate and control. And so I started reading the Vinaya uh, as much as I, I didn't have much, there wasn't much literature at the time in English. But uh, I began to understand the value of these precepts. Uh, something I needed to practice with because I could see my own personal tendencies were quite manipulative and uh, self-centered. And so when I met this monk, Ajahn Somai, he was a disciple of Ajahn Chah who was uh, who came to stay temporarily in Wat Nam Pranav. And he was a very impressive monk. Always went on Bindabhat, wore kind of brown robes, ate from his alms bowl, didn't have money. He seemed like a really, you know, the personification of what a good bhikkhu or Buddhist monk should be. And he's the one that informed me about Ajahn Chah. And so he said, when you ordain as a bhikkhu, you must go to stay with Lumpur Chah in Uborn. And I had no idea where Uborn was. <laughs> so so uh, 
I went to my preceptor in the town of Nong Thai and asked him to ordain me and he agreed to send me to spend the first rainy season retreat with Lung Pa Cha in Nu Buon. So that's how I ended up with uh, through circumstances, like is it destiny, fate, or coincidence? But I'm, uh, at this time, Lung Pa Cha was not well known, only in the local area of Nu Buon. And um, I never heard of him before. And so when I met him, I was, uh, you know, I was open to him. He's a very welcoming kind of presence, a very charismatic person, that personality, and uh, a kind of joyful presence. And uh, so I felt kind of at ease with him, you know, right off, right from the beginning. Then I didn't feel with other Kuwajans I met. I felt very kind of careful and tense. But with Lung Pa Cha, I felt uh, this sense of relaxing and openness and his, and uh, so I stayed there for, I, as long as I could, because I liked the monastery, I liked the style of life, and they were very strict with the Vinaya. So I learned how to bow, how to uh, keep the precepts in the Vinaya in a way that I had no knowledge of before. Gave up money. Even as a summoner, I had money. No, that seemed to be taken for granted. Where in Wat Papua, you couldn't have any money. So uh, I gave that up, and then uh, all the, the Kwa Wat, the, what they call the, what do we call that? The, the in house rules of the monastery. House rules of the monastery. And uh, that seemed very important to the lifestyle. Everybody had to conform to the same house rules. So even the senior monks, even Lung Pa Cha, conformed to the house rules. And so there's a lot of camaraderie in the sense that every monk was there to draw water from the well or sweep the ground or uh, when we were washing our robes or there's this communal spirit that everybody was doing. Uh, you know, participating in these in this, this, uh, house rules together. So it gave a sense of real Sangha community that uh, even though it took me a long time to learn Thai and the Isan dialect, I began to, you know, I appreciated the opportunity it gave me to train in a way that that I admired. I admired the monks, I admired Lung Pa Cha, I admired the whole attitude that I encountered when I met him at Wat Pa Pong. Thank you very much for sharing this, Lung Pa.